All right, welcome back. We are so glad to have everyone join us. I know we're looking forward to this afternoon's presentations. Um, just a couple of reminders and, and housekeeping items. Um, please feel free, if you have questions through a presentation or at the end of the presentation, please feel free to leverage the Q&A chat box. Um, the Q&A function, I should say, not to confuse with, with chat. That way we can get those and, and the uh, presenter can be prepared to uh, take a look at those questions. We're trying to get to as many questions as we can. Um, the other piece is I just wanted to remind everyone that there will be a survey that's going to be coming out. Um, you should receive it by tomorrow morning. We would love to have your feedback on your experience with this event. This is our first Pompeii Symposium that we're doing and, and would love to hear your thoughts on what you liked, what you would have liked to see added possibly to the agenda and all of those kind of things. So we would greatly appreciate your feedback. Uh, so now we're going to go ahead and move on to, a, to our next presentation, which is um, which is done by Stephanie Austin, and she's going to be presenting on best practices and future considerations for clinical care in Pompeii. And before I turn it over to Stephanie, I did want to, uh, did want to give her an, an introduction. Stephanie Austin is a certified genetic counselor with a dual master's degree in genetic counseling and educational psychology from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. She has worked with Dr. Priyana Kishnani and her glycogen storage disease team at Duke University, currently as a senior research program leader for almost 13 years. Stephanie spends most of her time coordinating glycogen storage and lysomal storage disease clinic research, both Duke and industry initiatives. She is an active member of the Association of Gly Glycogen Storage Disease Scientific Advisory Board, and in her free time, she likes to travel with her husband and, um, and have fun with her two-and-a-half-year-old son. So with that, Stephanie, will you take it away? Hi, thank you, Elise. Um, obviously, that hobby was pre-COVID, so now I um, have some new hobbies. Uh, mostly taking care of my son and trying to work at the same time. But I'm going to share uh, my slides now, make sure that they come up correctly. So I'll let um, Elise or someone tell me if yes. they're not yep. showing. We, nope, we see them. We see them well. You're good to go. Okay, perfect. So thank you for having me. Um, I know everyone had planned for this meeting back at the beginning of March. Um, and I remember, you know, a lot of transition back and forth about how to move forward. Um, but I'm really glad to be here and to share some thoughts um, from the Duke program and then just across the Pompeii research spectrum. So I'll spend a little bit of time on um, just an introduction of Pompeii. I know you've had a really nice background um, with some of the COVID considerations, um, drug development. Um, and I would expect most people on the call today will have a good background of Pompeii, but I'll go into just a little more of the pathophysiology. Um, what does CRIM mean and CRIM status and why do we do that? Enzyme replacement. And then I'll talk a little bit about both the um, infantile or the pediatric spectrum of disease and then also the adult spectrum. Um, and within that, I'll include a little bit of information about some of the younger children um, who have been detected via newborn screening with late onset Pompeii. Um, I'll show a few um, ideas for biomarkers and ways that we non-invasively can track different symptoms and signs of Pompeii um, through clinical monitoring. And then um, talk a little bit about the need for improved treatments, which I think is a great way to end um, and kind of lead into tomorrow um, for the drug roundtable. So Pompeii disease really is a, a continuum of disease spectrum. Um, infantile onset, which is generally classified as symptom onset less than 12 months of life with cardiac involvement. Um, and this can be within the first days of life with hypotonia, muscle weakness, um, a large tongue, macroglossia. Um, and then also the classic infantile, um, or the non-classic, which is less cardiac, involve, uh, less cardiac involvement um, longer survival without treatment. And then the late onset phenotype, um, which can present anywhere from within that first year, which we're learning more with um, newborn screening, and then as late as the sixth decade. So we know that there's a natural course of Pompeii disease, and it's a progression really from healthy muscle um, to irreversible muscle damage. Uh, and I know that there was a question about that, about how um, do we, 
um, address um, and hopefully fix that ir irreversible damage. And, you know, obviously with newborn screening, um, we're hoping to intervene with the treatment and intervene at the state of healthy muscle and retain that muscle strength and muscle function as long as possible. So L-glucosidase alpha myozyme lumozyme um, is known, uh, myozyme outside of the U.S. and lumozyme in the U.S. Um, was approved in 2006 and in 2010, um, respectively, as treatments for Pompeii. And at this time, this is the only FDA-approved treatment. But as we know, there's a number of other drugs and treatments on the horizon, um, both um, new enzyme replacement therapies, um, new um, adjunctive therapies, um, gene therapy. So there's lots of new pieces coming down the road. Um, and I think this is especially helpful and thoughtful for um, the younger children who, whose, patient, whose parents are receiving these diagnoses via newborn screening um, for that hope for the future, but also for our, our um, older patients and patients who have been diagnosed for a longer amount of time, knowing that there's a significant amount of interest um, and effort going into Pompe disease. So we know that, that we have a treatment and it's enzyme replacement therapy, but there are a number of factors really that affect the response, individual response to ERT. And one of those that has been brought up was the degree of muscle damage that occur, occurs prior to treatment, um, when the age of treatment um, begins, and then also if there's any, um, um, you know, how long the disease um, symptoms have been, have been going on, um, what type of muscle fibers, um, autophagy is a, a keyword that often um, originated um, and came a lot through Nina Rabin's group. Um, are there changes in the gene, these ACE polymorphisms, that potentially could signify a um, not as good response to therapy? Um, and then, you know, one that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, and we have some expertise in at Duke, is the CRIM status. Um, that would be cross-reactive immunologic material. And with a negative CRIM status, those patients in the past have had a um, not as good um, a reaction to the therapy. So we'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. So I'm sure most of you who follow Pompe disease patients or um, have Pompe disease yourself or care for someone who does um, have heard the words CRIM positive and CRIM negative, but just to give you a little background on what we're talking about when we say that. Um, so patients with Pompeii have a spectrum of the GAA protein, um, and that is when you're missing that protein, that's what causes Pompeii. So if you have any amount of the protein present, and that's determined by your genetic changes, your variants or mutations, then you're considered CRIM positive. And in general, um, this is having some residual enzyme, whether it's functioning or not. Um, but the body recognizes that enzyme as self. And therefore, there's usual lower, usually lower antibody titers created by your body. Um, but there are some people that still do create high antibodies. And in general, patients who are CRIM positive have a um, a good response, but if you do develop those antibodies, there could be a, a poorer response. And then for the other factors that I've indicated, um, that can determine response to ERT. Um, I'll just point out that any patients who are late onset, we would consider to be CRIM positive, um, and that's because your, um, your disease um, onset is usually generally a little bit later, and be because it's later, it means you've had some enzyme available um, to support your body and maybe make your onset a little bit later. Um, that same explanation doesn't necessarily apply for the children picked up via newborn screening because they usually come to attention without any symptoms. Um, but we determine CRIM status on the amount of enzyme present. And we would say that patients who don't have the cardiac involvement, so the late onset, are CRIM positive. So CRIM negative, it's complete lack of the GAA protein, and that's having two deleterious mutations or variants. So that's when you have two variants that are very severe that don't allow any enzyme to be made. So when the enzyme replacement therapy is given to these patients, 
it's not recognized as self. So it's recognized as a foreign body and then your, your body makes persistent high antibody titers to the enzyme. And this can lead to a poor clinical response. So one way that we have uh, tried to address this um, is through an immune tolerance um, protocol. And this is the protocol that we use for naive patients, so patients who have never seen enzyme replacement therapy, have never been exposed to it, um, and who are CRIM negative. So as you would expect, these are babies, either detected via newborn screening or with after clinical signs and symptoms have been recognized. And I'm not gonna go through the specific um, regimen, but it's, it's done at the same time as the first dose of enzyme. And it involves um, three different medications, rituximab, methotrexate, and IVIG. And they're done for the first six weeks of treatment. And this allows um, your body to adjust to the enzyme and hopefully blocks some of the response that you would have to antibodies. So you can see here, um, the therapeutic protein, which is represented in green above the purple cell, um, presents to the immune system. And your immune system then can create all of these downstream effects, which in the end you can see um, on the right side um, show the development of antibodies. But when we intervene with the rituximab and the methotrexate, which affects different cells in your immune system, helper T cells, B cells, memory B cells, when we intervene with those drugs, we stop that process and therefore stop the antibody production. Um, so moving on then to enzyme replacement therapy itself, um, as I said, it was approved as a treatment in 2006. And since then, patients have really been followed very closely. Um, we have a better understanding of the disease. And because of the treatment, we have now this new natural history that has been emerging since the first uh, patients that were treated. We're recognizing more phenotypes and more presentations of the disease. And there are a number of therapies on the horizon. Um, and you can see that from just the number of sponsors that are here today um, for this, this great um, meeting. So prior to newborn screening, how were most children picked up um, with infantile onset Pompeii? And you can see here, um, a number of those symptoms have to do with cardiac issues, cardiomegaly, having a large heart, cardiomyopathy, um, heart failure, and then also um, low muscle tone, respiratory weakness, muscle weakness, problems with feeding, pneumonia. And we know that from um, our patients that we've studied ourselves with natural history since ERT, patients that were picked up earlier, um, that could have been prior to newborn screening, that could have been because there was a family history of Pompeii. So therefore a sibling was picked up uh, prior to birth and then started on enzyme as soon as possible. Um, so those patients we know, you know, would have been treated less than six months of age. And as you um, move forward with treatment, the patients who were treated earlier have better functional status than those that are treated later. And this, all this information comes together um, with some of the information from outside the US to really convince states to add newborn screening um, so that we can start treatment as early as possible. So you, hear, you see here, um, as of this month, there are 22 states indicated in orange that are screening for Pompeii disease as part of their newborn screening. Um, but there's also a number of states that are pending implementation or have pending legislation, um, or there's a regulatory change that is waiting. Um, and then there's a num there are a few states um, that have no screening and no bill has been introduced. I think you know, one of the interesting things that, has, that we've learned from newborn screening um, really has to do with the um, number of patients or the frequency of Pompeii disease we see in the population. And if we look here from information that was collected from the Missouri newborn screening um, pilot, the New York pilot, which I know Dr. Lau was a, a great part of, um, the Illinois pilot, you see the, the 
a frequency of people who um, in the population, the babies that were born that ended up screening positive and then having Pompe disease. In the past, we always quoted the number to be about one in 20,000 is what we would expect. Um, but now you can see here that in Missouri, the frequency ended up being about one in about 10,000. And then in New York, a little bit higher, one in 17,000. And then in Illinois, a little bit higher, one in 24,000. So we're seeing that these frequency numbers really can vary from state to state and population to population. So what did we, what have we learned? What did we learn after starting newborn screening? Um, that the, the number of patients, the incidence or frequency is about one in 10,000 to maybe one in 24,000. Um, that infantile Pompe disease presents at birth within the first few days of life. And you can have a, a good outcome, um, especially when you intervene at those early times with appropriate immune modulation protocols. Yet what we're seeing down the road has been still these patients and people do have some residual disease, some continued muscle weakness um, and other areas of weakness that still need to be addressed with a better treatment. Um, and then late onset, that these babies who have been picked up with the common adult onset splice site variant um, which we sometimes call the IVS variant. It's the Caucasian, it's a variant seen in the Caucasian population um, for Pompeii and about 80% of adults. Um, that these babies can present even in the first few months of life. And there's been some involvement of muscle groups that we see in the adult presentation. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those pieces that we've picked up clinically um, on children with the late onset variant and then also what we've seen via newborn screening. So we know um, a lot of what we've learned in the past has been from um, some of the international newborn screening programs and Taiwan was one of those. Um, one of their first uh, publications was in 2009 and it looked like, um, and it, it, was, it was talking about and showing the improving prognosis um, of patients with Pompe disease when there is newborn screening and early treatment. And you can see here that um, a number of these patients received enzyme replacement therapy within the first month of life or a few days after. And then um, it gives the number um, of months when the child um, walked. And you can see that this falls within or very close to what we would expect for um, typical development, nine to 18 to 20 months. Um, so the results really indicate that the early treatment can benefit infants with Pompeii and it needs to be an early diagnosis which supports newborn screening. So here, um, I know that the, the focus of this talk was really to talk about best practices and um, management. There's a, a number of really great management guidelines that are published. Um, this one is through the ACMG. If you don't have these and you're a person with Pompe disease or a parent, you should have these guidelines. You should read them. You should know what's recommended. Um, there are cardiology recommendations. There are pulmonary recommendations, gastrointestinal nutrition musculoskeletal. Um, so if you're in an area where maybe your treating physician um, doesn't follow as many um, patients with Pompeii as some of the more experienced centers, you can still use these guidelines to make sure your child is getting or you, you yourself are getting the best treatment. Um, so with those guidelines being presented, I'm not going to go through specifically what they are, um, but I will go through some things that we're continuing to learn and some areas where we want to make sure we're still um, managing and following our, our patients, our younger patients, our pediatric um, infantile patients. So um, this paper now is about eight years ago, but at that point we looked really closely at what is the, the new phenotype or what we would call the, um, the picture of infantile patients with Pompe who've been on enzyme replacement therapy. So prior to enzyme replacement therapy, as you know, a number, um, the children, most of the children would die or pass away by about two years of age, especially when they have significant cardiac 
um, problems. So um, here we were able to look at those patients who were treated and then therefore have a different picture of disease. So we know um, the long-term infantile survivors do have a specific picture. Um, in terms of cardiac manifestations, we still do see some fibrosis, um, some cardiac arrhythmias, some enlargement of the aorta or the large blood vessel that comes out of the heart. Um, some eye findings that should be followed, um, some um, issues with acquiring speech, and then some issues with speech due to hypernasal um, speech, and then some neurologic um, issues. So definitely through the central nervous system, and that's one thing at Duke we're really trying to understand a little bit better, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So. Um, I, I have highlighted here some of the long-term cardiac complications because I think that this is important. Um, most of the children with infantile Pompeii do have significant cardiac um, size and mass at birth, but then within starting, with starting enzyme replacement therapy, within the first few months, that mass really does decrease and improves. But that doesn't mean that um, the cardiac evaluation piece is over. Um, we really recommend and want to make sure that families are having these regular um, rhythm measures, which is the EKG, the um, electrocardiogram, and that would par particularly be looking for arrhythmia. As the heart shrinks um, after the enzyme replacement therapy and the heart um, size improves, there does continue to be these regular um, these um, arrhythmias um, that that can show up even down the road. So it needs to be followed on a regular basis. Um, there can be um, long-term musculoskeletal issues and the residual muscle weakness and gross motor function tend to be below what we would expect for the age of the child. There are very specific muscles that are, um, that are weakened, the neck flexors, um, the ankle dorsiflexors the hip extensors, ab and adductors in the hips, um, and then some of the muscles of the face. And when we have this chronic residual weakness, um, especially when it causes an imbalance across the joints, there can then be secondary muscle problems. So following with a physical therapy group or a physical therapist who has a good knowledge of Pompeii disease, even if it's just from reading the literature and being familiar with what muscles can be weak, um, I think it's very important to, to reduce those secondary muscle, musculoskeletal impairments. Um, in that original study from 2012, um, um, bone density was looked at or the strength of the bones, and five of the eight patients did have lower bone density. Um, it seems to improve with continued enzyme replacement therapy and again, um, getting appropriate um, exercise and uh, movement of the muscles, as well as taking vitamin D. We do see some hearing loss in the long-term surviving patients, about 33%. And again, this is potentially due to um, CNS or central nervous system involvement. Um, it could be inner ear pathology, maybe something to do with the middle ear. But again, making sure that your child um, has the correct hearing support, whether it's um, regular hearing testing or making sure that they're using their hearing devices appropriately. So, you know, I think one piece that a lot of parents have questions about and one way that we can really intervene and improve the quality of life for children um, is through their language and speech and then also through education, um, having them connect to peers and um, have as typical as, as possible um, a learning experience. So this was a um, publication from our group looking at language and speech in children with infantile Pompeii. And um, 12 of the children were um, assessed once and then six of those children had follow-up. And the most common thing seen were um, articulatory disorders and then hypernasality. And that was in about 82% of the patients. Um, some disorder of speech or language was really found in all participants at some point. And overall, though, the language delays that were seen seem to improve over time. So I think if you're a new parent 
with Pompeii, about child with Pompeii, then knowing that your child, even with ERT, does still appear to have a, um, a higher chance of having a speech or language disorder and staying in good contact with a, a speech therapist, having someone that has a good background in um, children with hypernasality and speech. Um, and this is an area where we continue to investigate um, whether it's through improving um, enzyme replacement therapy, moving to the, through the blood-brain barrier and being able to uh, improve treatment of the central nervous system, um, other adjunctive therapies, um, respiratory muscle strength training, which then can also work on the bulbar muscles of the neck and face. Um, so here again, looking at um, swallowing in children and infants with Pompe disease. And here in these children, um, this was a baseline study. So this was done prior to starting enzyme replacement therapy and they were swallow studies. And you can see that all 13 children here prior to starting enzyme replacement therapy had some form of problems with swallowing, whether it was mild to moderate to even severe. Um, and because of that um, weakness in the muscles around the throat and the swallowing in the mouth, um, there was also some airway invasion present in about 77% of subjects. So when the children were eating or swallowing, then they potentially would take food or um, milk or formula into their lungs, which then would put them at higher risk for pneumonias too. So um, as we move then more into the um, cognitive and academic outcomes, I'm going to highlight what we knew back in 2012. Um, this was a study looking at children four to eight years old. And if you remember, enzyme replacement therapy started um, for these children who were in the clinical trials around 99, 1999 or 2000. So um, around 2012, the children that we were following were four to, six, four to eight years old, kindergarten to fourth grade. Um, and the children with classic infantile were functioning um, in the average range, the lower end of average for their typical, compared to their typical peers when using IQ tests. But there was no evidence of cognitive decline at that point. Um, and that patients who had atypical Pompeii, infantile Pompeii with less heart involvement did have above average IQ and then did continue to gain IQ over time. Um, but we knew at that point that really the motor function can, adapt, can impact the adaptive behavior. So whether it's being able to communicate speech or whether it's how the tests were being given, we knew that those could be issues um, in assessing the children, but also what the children were able to accomplish. Um, so here in 2000, um, I think this was 2017, so five years after the original data, looking again at the cognitive and academic outcomes in these children and, and what looked different or what did we see as these children continued to get older. Um, so these were um, some of the same participants from prior and then um, a, a, some additional new participants. Um, and consistent with earlier findings, the IQ median scores um, were falling towards the lower end of the average range compared to same age peers. Um, and when we looked at the profiles of the children who were being tested and the different tests that, were, that we, were, um, we were doing, the profiles really were more consistent with the learning disability rather than um, an intellectual disability. So the, the participants, um, there were kind of two groups, one that had average school scores and one who had below average. So the children who actually had the average academic skills, we would, they seemed to also have average um, cognitive abilities. And their speech and language skills seemed to be um, better intact. They were able to speak more clearly. They had less, less hypernasality. Um, and then there was also a group of children who didn't do quite as well at school and seemed to have um, lower test scores on the tests that were performed as part of this research study. You know, I think one of the most important pieces that's come out of this study is making sure that you use the appropriate tests to capture both 
verbal and nonverbal abilities. When you have an issue with speech and that really, that can really impact the scores that you get on certain tests. So making sure that the, the tests um, and the people administering the tests really are taking into consideration the individual's motor skills, speak, speech and language abilities, um, and their native language. So when we look at 2012 versus 2016, um, we do see it's um, the 2016 now goes up to grade 12. Um, and the lower performing IQ academic tests really potentially are reflecting learning disabilities and not necessarily an overall lower IQ. So making sure that children are getting appropriate testing, but then appropriate support for their learning. Um, I'm going to go a little bit faster and end here um, with the infantile group on the CNS or the central nervous system. And this is one area at Duke where we're really focusing on and um, learning more about um, the differences between the infantile children and the children who have late onset. Um, what are, what is the involvement of the central nervous system and how does that um, impact cognition, behavior, language, and speech? And then once we know those pieces, how can we uh, better improve treatment? So we know that traditional enzyme replacement therapy doesn't necessarily get to the central nervous system. Um, so how can we develop better treatments that do? And then also how can we measure that? So now changing just a little bit, going into late onset Pompeii. Um, this is again a spectrum. Some people have symptoms as far back as they can remember. Some people um, say I did great until I was 40 or 35 and I had my first child. Um, typically there is no cardiomyopathy in late onset. There can be some cardiac involvement um, through that uh, dilated aorta or um, rhythm disturbances. And in general, most adults um, do have this common IVS splice mutation or splice variant. And here, this is one of the, the milder variants, which allows some of that enzyme to be made, therefore makes the um, onset of the disease a little bit later, the symptoms less severe than the infantile onset, um, and creates that crim positive picture. Late onset also is a multi-system disease. And with treatment in the adults, we're seeing the same change in the picture and presentation of the disease. Um, we continue to see some um, cardiac changes, some changes in the vascular system, um, um, eyelid drooping, which is also called ptosis, some GI changes. And I'm gonna highlight a few of these here. Um, lingual weakness, um, weakness of the tongue. And if you've seen Dr. Kishnani or another provider, um, this is often tested by the physician or the practitioner placing their hand against the face and then asking the patient to push their tongue against the cheek and measure. Sometimes it's when you blow your cheeks open wide and then whether or not you can keep the air in your mouth when, you're, um, um, when the, your cheeks are pushed on. Um, and here we look at this pretty closely. And as you move um, through lingual strength and you go from normal to mild to moderate to severe, um, we see that this can be associated as you move from mild to moderate with problems with swallowing or actual significant problems with swallowing or changes in the way your speech, um, the way that you are able to speak. So this is another important thing to continue to watch is if you notice changes in your speech, if you notice your tongue is weak or is getting weaker, make sure that you can swallow appropriately. Make sure maybe talk with your provider about a swallow study if you seem to be coughing or choking on um, foods or having a hard time chewing certain things. Um, this is a nice study that Dr. Kishnani, um, Dr. Byrne, who I know was on earlier may still be on, um, Dr. Berger was the last author and expert in pulmonology for Pompeii. Um, this was recently published in January, and it was looking at respiratory function in patients who were treated with enzyme, and what does the respiratory function look like over time? 
So it was a great study with a lot of collaborators looking at the forced vital capacity or the PFT, the pulmonary function data from adults, um, 396 patients. So the median baseline FVC, um, this is a number, if you follow your uh, um, FVC, we look at usually in upright and supine. Um, this was about 66% in the patients who were looked at. And what they were able to see with this um, study was that the FVC really did remain stable during the five-year follow-up. Um, there were some groups where it was lower, some subgroups, and this, gen this tended to be patients who were male, older at ERT initiation, or had a longer duration from symptom onset to starting ERT, and therefore maybe had more advanced disease at baseline, um, or just patients in general who um, didn't present for treatment until um, more advanced disease. It didn't seem that the age at symptom onset was necessarily associated with baseline degree of respiratory function. So the FVC was stable, which in turn would suggest that breathing um, was stable over five years. And therefore we would say that um, respiratory function is preserved during long-term ERT in real world settings. And that the early initiation of ERT was associated with preservation of the FVC in patients with late onset um, with better respiratory function at the time of treatment. So again, saying that you shouldn't have, if you know you have Pompe disease, you don't wanna wait until you have significant symptoms or issues before starting ERT. You really can preserve some of that muscle strength and respiratory functioning the earlier you start. Um, another area that is being um, looked at a little more closely um, is looking at smooth muscle. Um, so this is different than the skeletal muscle. Smooth muscle um, would be your aorta, your eyes, GI, um, genitourinary, so bladder, um, some in the airway, your trachea. Um, so if you've ever had issues with any of these areas, you know that Pompeii disease and glycogen um, accumulation does occur in these areas too. Um, there have been reports of vascular symptoms, so aneurysms in both the brain and the, the artery I mentioned um, coming out of the heart. Um, and then also GI symptoms, um, constipation, reflux, incontinence. So smooth muscle, in addition to the CNS and the skeletal muscle, um, is an important target for future therapies. Um, this is just giving an example here of um, um, an aneurysm, a basal or artery aneurysm in the brain. Um, and an aneurysm is an expansion or um, a larger um, area of the blood vessel, and that can um, rupture and cause issues, whether it's the brain or in the heart. And we think that this aneurysmal dial. Um, dilation, which is in the uh, blood vessel of the heart, um, can be an unreported vascular complication of late onset Pompeii. So when you have your echocardiogram or your echo, you should also um, be sure that the physician is checking the diameter of the aorta coming out of the heart. Also in adults, we do see some um, swallowing issues. Um, it's not necessarily as rec well recognized in late onset Pompeii as it is in infantile Pompeii, um, but the motor speech deficits that we sometimes see in adults with Pompeii can commonly occur with problems with swallowing. So patients, as I showed before, with the lingual weakness or the tongue weakness, if you have trouble clearing the food from your mouth, if you have trouble, um, um, so, you know, pressing when someone puts resistance on your face, then you can be at increased risk for the dysarthria and dysphagia and should have that screening done as part of your regular, regular clinical care. Um, this was a collaboration we did with our um, urogynecology and neuro um, colleagues at Duke, um, really just expanding our understanding of what some of the lower urinary tract symptoms are and continence in both males and females with Pompeii. And what we saw is that half of the male patients really had um, stream issues or complained of post-void dribbling or being unable to stop urination midstream. 
And then in the, the female population, um, we saw urinary incontinence, post-void dribbling, and then also the same, the same issues. Um, so there are interventions for these. Um, some of this can be age-related. Um, the percentages we were seeing were greater than what you would expect to see age-related. So if you do have these issues, um, be sure to speak with your physician. This is something that's seen across patients with Pompeii. There are physical therapy interventions. Um, there are medication interventions. Um, and a number of people that I've talked with have identified this as a significant issue for their quality of life. So pay attention to um, the symptoms here. Um, and then another area that we're starting to um, kind of think about are the gastrointestinal findings in Pompeii. Um, and we know that there's a prevalence of certain GI symptoms and it's more than the general US population, gas bloating, constipation, diarrhea. And again, here, 38% of patients who answered the survey um, really thought that the G GI symptoms were one of their top three reasons um, to, were one of the top three reasons that reduced their quality of life. So we're continuing to investigate this and understand what the causes are. Um, and then within the last five minutes here, I just want to touch briefly on um, the patients who were detected via newborn screening, um, children with the IVS splice site. So one important consideration is that we looked back at all the patients that we follow who had the IVS splice site, and we looked to see what their cardiac um, manifestations were. And the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was really rare, but we continued to see arrhythmias even in um, adults, but also in children and infants. So again, if you're not having an echo, um, continue to have uh, the ECG or the EKGs over time. Um, so this is a nice paper um, because these are children who were detected with late onset Pompeii via newborn screening and had the common late onset variant. And out of the seven children here, all seven patients had some motor involvement by six years. So the important thing to remember, if your child is diagnosed with late onset via newborn screening, um, is that there can be some um, motor issues and making sure that you're getting the appropriate physical therapy exam um, and the most appropriate um, evaluations during those first six months, year, two years. Um, and it doesn't mean that necessarily enzyme replacement therapy is a needed intervention, um, but some of these pieces, the muscle weakness, um, can be addressed through physical therapy interventions, exercises at home, um, but things to keep your child within the the typical age range of development. Um, so I think I'll just highlight quickly um, two ways that we monitor our patients outside of um, the usual lab work. Um, HEX4 or GLUC4 I think has been um, a typical um, biomarker that's done across um, specialists and providers at this point for Pompeii. Um, it seems to correlate well with muscle glycogen and clinical severity in infantile Pompeii. Um, when we see an increase um, in HEX4, we know that this can potentially proceed or come before a significant clinical decline. Um, so we watch these numbers fairly closely. Um, also, one area that we continue to look at with Pompeii at Duke is whole body MRI or looking at which muscles have been replaced with fat. Um, this is a recent paper that we've published last summer, looking at whole body MRI and late onset Pompeii, and then correlating it with functional measures. So we were able to um, look at certain muscles and then think about where those muscles were used in terms of strength. So just as an example, the gluteus maximus is used with hip extension. Um, what are the muscles that, are, um, that contribute to gait speed, climbing four stairs, standing from supine? I think that's my, um, I think I just got a cue that I have maybe one or two minutes left. Um, but what I'll just say here is that um, the overall fat fraction or the amount of fat 
that is um, accumulating in the muscles seems to correlate well with muscle strength. So as the amount of fat goes up in the muscle, the muscle strength declines. And that's what you would expect. As your muscle is replaced by fat, you have less um, muscle to perform the activities that you need to do on a daily basis. And again, this is the same that we see with the functional studies. So um, the time to stand from a chair, the longer amount of time that it takes you um, is associated with higher fat or less muscle. So muscles, muscle strength is a good predictor of fat infiltration um, and that your functional scores can estimate to a certain extent the degree of fatty involvement in your muscles. We know that there's um, need for improved treatments um, and this really I'll highlight here the higher if we consider the treatment that's approved um, it's really enzyme replacement therapy and the need for higher dosing. Um, there's a number of great um, publications at this point showing clinical benefits um, from um, higher doses. And if this is something that you're interested in, feel free to reach out to me and I can provide some of those publications. We recently had, I'm just gonna go to it here. We recently had a publication um, that looked at um, higher dosing in children. And it showed, we looked at our patients and then a review of the literature. And we were able to say that, um, I'm gonna skip through these and just give you the conclusions here. Um, I'll tell you that it was safe. Um, we saw improvements in um, physical therapy measures, the functioning measures. And what we can say is that the initiation or early administration of a higher dose should be considered before significant muscle damage develops. Even small delays can lead to irreversible damage. And ideally, patients with infantile Pompeii should be started on 40 mg per kg weekly. Um, and then also patients who have late onset, whether they're children or adults, should be monitored closely for decline. Within those decline or those plateau times, motor function um, can be followed closely, looking at biomarkers, looking at PFTs. Um, all of those things put together can indicate poor response to treatment and indicate higher doses. So if this is something that you're considering for your child, regular clinical assessments, um, physical therapy assessments, looking at the biomarkers, whether that's HEX4 or the other measures that your physician um, does, and then uh, pulmonary function testing, pulling all those pieces together to show um, lack of improvement or a decline. Um, so here, acknowledging, thanking, um, we've had great support from a number of sponsors that are also um, listed for today's meeting. So I, I went through the end pretty quickly, um, but I'm happy to take some questions. And um, perfect. Yeah, we do have a few questions that have came on, Stephanie. So I'll go ahead and can, kind of moderate some of those. We'll go here for a little bit to, to try and get through some of these. Sure. Um, one of the questions is the referenced recommended guidelines for Pompeii is dated as of May 2006. What have we learned since then? Um, how are we more knowledgeable as a community in the last 15 years? What did we get wrong and what did we get right from that point in time? Sure, and I think, um, I'm guessing that that um, question was probably maybe asked early on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Because yeah. I, I think I highlighted a fair amount of that. You know, Perfect. I don't, you know, I don't know that we um, addressed the CNS um, pieces as clearly as should have been in 2006. You know, I think we're learning more about um, cognitive development. I think we're learning more about the brain um, and changes on MRI. Um, I think over time, we just, we continue to learn from the patients so many new things. Um, you know, we knew in the beginning that the heart was fixed pretty, pretty early and that, you know, that was gonna carry these children through um, the treatment. But you know, we, we continue to recognize now that the EKG findings or the arrhythmias um, still occur. So um, there are pieces from those guidelines that are helpful. And then I think I highlighted some, some newer yeah. pieces too. Yeah. 
Perfect. Another question that came up is just more kind of, I think about maybe some symptoms with Pompeii and it's someone who um, is getting a lot of swelling in their feet and ankles and it happens, um, you know, primarily at night. Um, it happened, so they went to the ER, they did some blood tests to see if there were blood clots, everything came back okay. They had not heard of this type of swelling in their feet and ankle and pain being a problem. Um, is it something that has been found in other Pompeii patients before? You know, I, I think we do have some patients that have that. You know, there's so many causes, um, so I'm not going to comment on, you know, a specific case, but you know, speaking with your physician, speaking with physical therapy, making sure that you're, um, I don't know what the mobility issues are potentially for the person, um, but you know, Dr. Kishnani often, if it's not something that's been reported in the literature, she will often take questions from other physicians. So reaching out to physicians that, having your physician reach out to other physicians um, that have large cohorts of patients with Pompeii, I think is an important lesson from that question um, to see how it's been treated in other people. This is uh, Dr. Lau. May I just respond? Hey, sure. Hi, Dr. Yeah, Lau. Hey. How are you? Oh, that was a fantastic presentation. Thank you, Stephanie, because you really went into the nitty gritty between infantile and late onset, which I you know, had to gloss over. But uh, for swelling, just we, we do see uh, swelling uh, develop in patients who have neuromuscular disease in general because of dependent edema. And it can worsen during heat and, um, and you know, in, in the summer and humidity, and also with salt intake. But it's really critical that you speak with your physician. And like you said, Stephanie, you know, reach out to other physicians um, if there's questions or concerns, um, you know, raising the feet up. And, and I do find that my neuromuscular patients require to use um, some uh, stockings, uh, compression stockings. So venous return, you know, you, you pull your blood. The, the, vein, the veins require you to pump it back. So if your, your mobility is, in, in, is, is difficult, you need to, um, to address that. So sometimes you need compression stockings. But again, that's not, a, not necessarily a rare disease question, but a mobility, neuromuscular, and it, I do see it in, in um, a variety of conditions. So definitely talk with your doctor about that and address it. It could be normal, but there are other ways to also to prevent it and to you know, reduce the morbidity associated with it. Sure. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. Perfect. Another question that came in is, um, how do you know the extent of a muscle damage? Is this something that can be tested seen? Is a muscle biopsy required? Well, I, I think if you want, there's a couple issues. One is muscle biopsies are invasive. Um, they're painful. Um, they potentially damage the part of the muscle um, where you take the, the biopsy. So, yeah, so to say that, but yes, we do sometimes take muscle biopsies on patients to look at changes over time. Um, if you've been in a research study, you know that that's often a piece of the research study. Um, in the practice, I would say most physicians do not take muscle biopsies just to stage disease or to determine the, the muscle. We use other um, surrogates for that. So that could be the HEX4 could tell you about that. Your physical therapy muscle strength can tell you about that. The whole body MRI, looking at fat infiltration can kind of tell you about it indirectly. So pulling those pieces together. Um, having said that, if you are going under general anesthesia for a procedure, um, we do sometimes suggest that you have a muscle biopsy done at that point um, and read for glycogen accumulation, read through regular pathology at your center. Um, and it's, it's especially helpful if you had had a previous biopsy too, so it can be something that's compared over time. But you do have to be careful even looking at it over time because depending on where the muscle sample is taken, um, certain areas can look either healthy or very unhealthy, but not necessarily represent every muscle in the body. Okay. Perfect. Um, I have someone on here who um, was just curious, is there a place uh, they care for a 20 year old um, who they state was in one of the original studies at Duke when he was uh, at age three for cognitive issues. Um, she's wondering, is there a place she can get some literature on the hearing implications sure, um, sure. that may come with Pompeii? Yeah, there, the person's welcome to reach out to me. Um, there's some published pieces. Um, we also have, 
a um, study where we're looking, where we do hearing assessment as well as um, other CNS measures. So I'm happy to, to speak with anyone that has questions about that and share some of those references too. Okay, perfect. And I think looking here, our last question um, is from someone whose son is now 15 years old and has been doing ERT since age two. Um, she states he had attended school up until last year. He had lost almost all of his normal activities and continues to do so for two years. And I don't know how to help him get back what he has. Um, she says he's not improving but continues to have ERT bi-monthly. She also shared that he did have a uh, tumor removed in 2019. Um, is there any suggestions of things that she can do to try and help her son as he, he does not seem to be improving with the ERT? Um, so again, it's hard to comment on specific yeah. people, but I'll give some general guidelines of things that we think about. Um, Increased dose is something to consider. If the patient is on every other week, I, I would wonder what the dose was every other week. Um, if it could be changed to every week um, or even just increased during that every other week timeline. Um, the usual dose is 20 mg per pig, pig, 20 milligrams per kilogram. Um, and that's what's written in the package insert for administering Lumazyme. But as I said, um, almost all of our patients are on 40 milligrams per kilogram every week. So even considering 40 every other week or 20 milligrams every week would improve um, dose. I think the second part is um, when she's talking about um, losing um, activities, I think she probably is talking about um, gross motor or um, muscle, but I think um, having um, a good physical therapy assessment and then continued physical therapy over time. Um, it shouldn't be something that's only done at your six month appointments. Um, that should be done. We have patients that go every week. Um, and I think that's really important if you have lost some muscle strength. Um, is the, is the, um, the patient connected appropriately to um, the physical therapy support system, wheelchair, other things that could be helpful? Um, and then if she was talking about cognitive decline or issues in school too, then I would wonder, um, has he had a developmental assessment? Are there certain um, recommendations that could be made that would help him be more successful in school? Um, certain um, supports he could have, whether they're special tools for learning um, or, or just ways to address any problems or, or issues that he might have. Perfect, perfect. Well, and thinking about hearing, has he had his hearing checked? Is he having trouble hearing? Um, so some of the things that can, that can, is he breathing well? Is he bre breathing while he's sleeping? So I think a good Pompeii assessment might be able to help too. Um, if you're not sleeping well, you're not thinking well. So is he retaining carbon dioxide overnight? So I think there's a fair number. I'm happy if other people have questions to have them reach out to me too, to think through some of these pieces. Yes, wonderful. All right, well, that sounds great. I think that will uh, close out this session. Stephanie, thank you so much for providing all of that wonderful information and for walking through all of that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Elise. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. Well, we're going to go ahead and just take a very short break. We'll maybe take just a, uh, a around a five minute break, come back around to uh, 224, 225, and we will uh, jump into the genetics and Pompeii disease presentation by Kara Anstead. <laughs> 